Hello. Ciao a tutti. Hello. Hello. Mr. Hello. 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 Va bene. Va bene, Va bene. grazie. <laughs> Farò parlare soltanto italiano oggi. <ride> Incredibile. <ride> Se va bene per lei. <ride> Se va bene per lei, per noi va benissimo. Okay, well, <ride> vediamo. <ride> Perfect, Italia. Conosco, conosco 20-30 parolacce, pa parlo, parole. Parole. Sì. Parole. parole ho insegnato le parolacce anche. <ride> il, il mio primo lavoro in, nel cinema era a Roma mm -hmm. 1965 mm -hmm. I was an extra come si dice extra? comparsa Comparsa. Sì. Comparsa. In un film uh, con Catherine Spack, mm? regista mm? era Nanny Loy. Ah, mm? ok. Ah. Uh, it was a nightclub. Si chiamava The Piper Club. Ah, uh, Piper Club. A questa epoca, uh, 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 it was the, the, hottest, the hottest nightclub in Rome. Sì, sí, um... E dove è nata Patti Bravo? I'm switching to English now. Yeah, no problem, absolutely. In between takes, we were dan I was hired to be a dancer in the background, you know? So in between takes, the other kids, they were all Italian. They taught me tutte le parolacce romane. <laughs> Every time I said one, they would burst into laughter and <laughs> like the funniest thing that ever heard. So I actually memorized them. And today I still use them when I'm driving in traffic and somebody cuts me off. I, I go to, I go to my Italian. Yeah. Very I, Italian I, style. I won't say it here because it was, it was just, it's, it's not polite. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> I don't know who's going to hear this. <laughs> Davide. <laughs> Cominciamo. Okay. Mr. Hirsch. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have you with us. You Thank are you. at the Academy Award. It's amazing. It's amazing. My name is Davide. And okay. the other two guys are Massimiliano and Francesco. Nice we to are... meet you, Mr. Hirsch. It's a pleasure. It's an honor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a big Real. honor. I knew a Massimiliano. We called him Ma. Ma? Ma. They call you Ma? No? Uh, Max uh, for me. But yeah, Ma, uh, I, I, I think that there was a friend of my father that used to call me Ma as well. So yeah, it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not unusual. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, we um, we wanted to ask you a few questions about you know your your history, your work, your uh, everything you've done, and uh, Davide wanted to start and, with your uh, yeah. You know. uh, we will talk uh, about this. Ah, oh, wonderful! Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, and how did the idea of writing a book come about? To write this book? Well, um, I was on location in Vancouver around 1999. I was working on a film called Mission to Mars, directed by Brian De Palma. And um, my wife was behind in Los Angeles. She hadn't come with me. When I go on location, um, it's very difficult for her. She doesn't have a job to go to. She doesn't have friends there. She doesn't have routine, you know, so she's basically, uh, if she accompanies me, I go to work, I see people, I have things to do. She's on her own all day with nothing to do and no friends. So um, we agreed that 
you know, she used to come with me at first and then after a while it was just too difficult for her and she, um, we decided she would stay behind. So on the weekend I'm by myself and um, kind of bored and lonely and looking for something to do myself. And um, I had been telling these stories, I would go to the set, you know, uh, when I had a I would take a, a half hour off from work and I'd go to the set. And, you know, on the set of a movie, you hang out with people and you tell stories. And so I've been telling these stories and I'm getting a good reaction from people hearing the stories. And I thought I should really write these down. Yeah. <laughs> so I started, so I, I wrote a chapter, I think the first thing I wrote was the chapter about I Love Trouble, mm -hmm. because that was a particularly uh, good story. And um, after I'd written it, I thought, you know, I should really write down, I should make an outline of all the stories that are sort of kicking around in my head. So I did that and I, I sort of did it picture by picture, going back to my first film and what I could remember about what happened on that film. And in my second film, I met Bernard Herrmann. So that was a very memorable experience. So I, so anyway, I made an outline um, of just a couple of words to trigger a memory that I intended to write about someday. So uh, when I had time, I would go to my outline and I would find something, when, when I wrote about something, I would turn the, the font to bold so I would know what I'd already written about and what I hadn't written about. So I just went back to this, uh, my notes over time, whenever I had a free moment or, uh, and I did that for 18 years. So sometimes I didn't work <laughs> on a book for three years at a time if I got busy at work but you know, over the years, uh, my periods of employment got shorter and my periods of unemployment got longer. Uh, and I had more time to spend on the book. And I finally finished the first draft in 2017. And I showed it to, uh, I mentioned it to a friend, a man named Nicholas Meyer, who uh, is a writer, director, I've known him since we were children. And he offered to read the book and, uh, and he said, I'll edit it for you. Well, he didn't edit it, but he read it and he gave me notes. And many of the notes were things like, um, well, how did you feel about that? You know, and uh, he wasn't really editing. He was asking me to write more, but they were very good notes. And uh, we got through the end of that process and he said, I'm going to introduce you to my literary agent, which he did. And um, she's this uh, woman named Charlotte Sheedy. She lives in New York. She's the mother of Ali Sheedy, the actress. And um, she met with me and she said, I think there's a book here, but it's way too long. And you have to cut it down. There are things in it that are offensive to women that I want you to address. And I was surprised because I, I didn't think there had been, but so what do you mean? She said, all that, you know, all that stuff about the naked women. I thought, what is she talking about? And <laughs> later I remembered. Um, so uh, she said, I want you to work with an editor at, you know, somebody I will recommend to you. I said, okay, who pays for the editor? She says, you do. I said, okay. <laughs> so uh, I called this woman and uh, she turned out to be a, a wonderful editor. We worked together um, for several months, but we never managed to get the picture down as uh, to the size that Charlotte had asked for. Um, she said, you have to get it down to 125,000 words. And my original draft was about 175,000. So it was almost, you know, a quarter of the book. And I, I worked with my editor and, and we got it down to about 145,000, but 
I said to her, I said, look, you know, we've cut out about 30,000 words already. Uh, I don't think I can cut any more, you know? I, she said, yeah, um, feels pretty tight to me too. So she said, I'll call Charlotte. And she called Charlotte and Charlotte said, oh, he, he was taking me too literally, you know? So I thought 125,000. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then she turned it over to a man in her office who's in charge of nonfiction. Charlotte only deals with fiction. So I worked with the, this new uh, agent and um, he, uh, I, I sent it to him by email and I expected, you know, you send a manuscript to somebody, you expect it to take a couple of weeks before they get back to you. And I sent it on a Thursday or something. Sunday night, I get an email from him with the manuscript attached and it's edited from beginning to end. There are comments and notes on every page all the way through the entire book. And I was, <laughs> I was shocked and, and alarmed. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I called my editor the next day and I said, you know, what's, what's going on here? And he was making, he was making comments like, too many names, there are too many names. And I thought, well, these are people that I worked with that I have a, an ongoing relationship with. I just, I can't just cut their name out of the book, you know? So um, she said, well, look, don't worry too much about the specific notes. The way to interpret this, she said, by the way, she's in her sixties. She says, in my entire career, I've never seen anyone do this before not only read the book in one weekend but edit it from beginning to end i i've never seen this before he said but i would take it as a sign that he really wants the book so i thought oh, yeah okay you know i said but there are things in there that i just won't do i mean he wants me to do things i'm just not going to do so i met with him and and i told him i said look you know you want me to cut that story forget it that's a deal breaker i'm not cutting that story he said fine fine you know i'm just i'm just making suggestions so around that time i read a book written by a japanese woman who had worked with kurosawa and it was called waiting waiting on the weather mm -hmm. and she described uh, her early career before she worked with kurosawa she had worked with uh, the famous director, so-and-so, who I'd never heard of, on the famous picture, so-and-so, which I'd never heard of, <laughs> starring the great actor, so-and-so, I'd never heard of. And <laughs> it went on like this for a while. And, I, and, and it started to dawn on me that, hmm, maybe all these names, maybe there are too many names in the book. you know. It, it slows down the reading if you're constantly coming up against the name of somebody you've never heard of. It's not helpful. So I decided that I would only talk about, uh, I decided that I would only give a person's name if I mentioned them more than one time. If I mention them, if they, if they recur in the story, if, you know, I have to give them a name because if I go back to them and say it, and then Tom said, you know, um, but other than that, if the, if the person mentioned was only mentioned once, it would be the assistant editor or the projectionist or the producer, or especially, I was very happy to cut out all the producer names because uh, nobody cares about them. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so, so we, we worked together and then after a while, he said, now look, I'm going to start to send the book out. I want you to get to carry the picture carry in the first 50 pages. So I looked at the, the book at that point and carry, I got to carry around page 90. So I thought, I can't cut this stuff out. The, the early stuff is what people always want to know. How did you get into the business? Yeah. That, that's what people are most interested in. I, I can't cut that out. You know? So I said to him, why, why in the first 50 pages? He says, well, 
when you send a manuscript out to readers for the publishers, they only read the first 50 pages. And Carrie is the first <laughs> film you worked on that everyone has heard of. <laughs> so I thought, well, I can't, you know. So my editor, Jennifer Shute, her name is, came up with a brilliant suggestion. She said, why don't you start with Carrie? So I thought, well, that's a very interesting idea. So we tried it and that's the way the book is structured now. I wrote an introduction just, I, I didn't want the book to be um, a textbook because I find that very boring. And you know, how to edit, I wasn't interested in, in that. That wasn't my point. So, but I felt that I had to explain what it is that editors do because there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. So I uh, wrote this introduction that sort of lays out all my thoughts about what editing is and is not. And um, sort of the aesthetic principles that guide me. And then I started the book, chapter one had been how I got started in the business, but instead I plugged in the chapter of on Carrie. And it, it, was, it was perfect because at the end of Carrie, I segued onto Star Wars. And I knew that Star Wars was the picture that everyone was most interested in. So um, at the end of the chapter on Carrie, I'm flying off to uh, Northern California to work on Star Wars. And then the next chapter, which used to be chapter one, is now chapter two. I retitled 10 years earlier because it was exactly 10 years earlier that I had decided to not pursue studying architecture, which was my original goal and work in film instead. So, um, so it was a nice kind of hook. I got Carrie at the beginning and yeah. <laughs> uh, had Carrie at the beginning. So everyone had heard of Carrie and it's a, it's a good chapter. It's very interesting. And um, when I got to yeah. that earlier, then I, then, I went, then I went chronologically. When I first started writing the book, I thought, well, I'm not going to write it chronologically. That's boring. So I started in the middle. And then I found that I was constantly having to explain. I had met so-and-so earlier when I worked on such and such a film. And, and it got very convoluted. And I thought, this is, this is not working out. I'll just, go, I'll just go in order. And it'll be simpler, like a story simply told but uh and i think that would have worked except you know for the fact that publishers readers only read the first 50 pages so we had to, yeah. we had to get it's, carrie in there right at the outset it's almost like the um, the story you say in the introduction i think about the um, uh, the producers not reading the script until the end only yeah. reading the first part of a script. So maybe they do many reviews for the last bit of a movie because they haven't actually read it. <laughs> right. But yeah, I, it, it's so. interesting. I, yeah, I, I think it's interesting to see someone that is such an historical figure in film editing go through the book editing process. Which similarities or differences do you think there are in the... Uh, so in these two kinds of editing, you in the book you say that these editings are uh, the movie editing is something completely new in art in general, different from you know paintings or uh, architecture. But how do you uh, which similarities or differences do you see in uh, between movie editing and uh, film editing and um, book editing? Well. Um... They're very similar, actually. Uh, the only difference is that in book editing, time is not an element. Uh, very much is so in, in film editing. But the process of uh, presenting your work and getting reactions to it and getting notes and making changes uh, was very familiar to me. So it didn't, it didn't worry me terribly much when people uh, came back with suggestions, um, first of all, because unlike film editing in the book, 
I was the one making the decisions. It was up to me what to do and what not to do. Um, in films, it's a collaborative process and the editor is, uh, as I described in the book, we have no power, although we do have influence. Yeah. We don't have any power, we can't make things happen. But in the book, I had the power. I mean, I, I could do it or not do it. And uh, so I didn't feel threatened particularly by uh, suggestions that people made. And sometimes they came up with some very good ideas. I thought uh, putting Carrie at the beginning was a very good idea, uh, but it was up to me whether to do it or not. But the, the, the process was very familiar, it was, you know, uh, cutting things out, streamlining, um, deciding, you know, uh, what to include and what not. I quote Michelangelo, he said, beauty lies in the purgation of the, uh, I'm changing his words, but it's something like purgation of the unnecessary, of the of superfluous, it's the purgation of the superfluous, you know. So uh, that's what it's about, is, you know, deciding what is necessary and what isn't, and in what order to present it is, uh, so it was a very familiar process to me. And, you know, when you get notes, your immediate reaction is, I'm not doing that, you know? And then, <laughs> and then, then you think about it and you think, well, maybe I can do something with this, you know, maybe there's something there. You know, you try to understand, when in my work, I always preferred to be presented with a problem rather than a solution. If somebody says, do this, uh, it doesn't, uh, I don't like working that way. But if somebody says, this is causing this, I'm having this problem because, you know, I'm confused or, or I'm bored or, you know, and then it's up to me to figure out what the solution is. Then I'm engaged and in, in participating in, in the creation of the film. But uh, there are some people who only like their own suggestions. They don't like anyone else's suggestions. And those people are people I try to avoid. But now I'm retired and I don't have to work for anyone, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I have a, a little technical question. I, yeah. I am a student of, uh, of editing. And... Uh, and I ask you, because you are a legend, you edit uh, everything. <laughs> and uh, what changed for you between uh, editing the film and uh, digitally with software and, uh, and computers for you personally? Well, I always liked working with my hands. Um, one of the things that attracted me to film editing in the first place was the tools. Um, the, the, uh, the splicer and the synchronizers and the reels. And, you know, I liked handling stuff and I had, I had uh, my different tapes and different colored pens and labels and, and, you know, working with film every day, you would get a roll of film from the lab. And when it's straight out of the lab, it's beautiful, this black disc of film gleaming, uh, untouched, you know, and uh, there was a tactile, it was a, it was a craft as, as well as an art, you know, it was, um, you're working with your hands and I, I, I liked that very much. And I did that for 25 years. And then the second 25 years I was on computers. And I think when you worked on film, uh, there was, a, there was a, a need to be right the first time. It was sort of like the difference between working in, uh, Car carving in marble or working with clay because if you if you're carving stone you can't change anything once you've cut something away it's gone yeah. whereas with clay you know oh I, I cut too deep there let, let me put some back you know so uh that's true of editing it's more like modeling in clay than it is like marble but even so when you were on film you didn't want a work print that was filled with splices where you had cut things short and then extended them because the splices go through and sort of interrupt your vision and, and, and uh, it, it degrades the experience some, you know, subliminally. So you try to, you know, because the work print is not only a guide 
to the negative cut or how to cut the film for eventual release, but it's also what you project to audiences as you're trying things out. So you have to take care of this artifact that we were making. And uh, I took pride in, in having, you know, a clean, good looking work print. And there was a, uh, there was a skill level, uh, skill aspect to it where, uh, where when you're working with your hands, you need a certain amount of skill. When you're sitting on a computer, you put it in trim mode, you add a frame and add another frame, add another frame, and then you go back and you, you know, this is more like working in, uh, in uh, um, what's the word, in, in not gesso, but in, uh, you know, doing a fresco. When they painted in fresco, they're working on wet plaster. They had to get it right the first time. Otherwise they have to chip it out and put replaster and paint over again, you know, but um, so it's like, you know, working in fresco as opposed to oil where you can paint over and keep painting over. Um, there was a premium pl placed on getting it right the first time. It's also, it was so complicated making changes and took so you had to un, you know, undo the splices and find the extension and add that. And it was a time consuming labor intensive process. Uh, so, like I say, there was a premium on people who could get it right the first time. And I took pride in having scenes that I cut um, the first time being in the finished film that the director looked at and said, great, no, no comments, you know, and we'll go with it just the way it is. And I always tried to make my scenes as good as possible in case we never got time to go back and revisit them. I always felt at least we can show this to the public and it's good enough for everyone, you know? So, uh, but of course, you know, you always uh, rework things as you go. But um, when I was introduced to digital editing for the first time, I thought, man, I'm gonna be able to go so fast on this thing because editing is not a technical process. It's a mental process where you're making judgments about how long something is and how, or how short, and if it's in the right place, is it um, so, you know, or is it necessary at all? So these are things that are unrelated to the tools. And it's sort of like, you know, if you're working with a pen or you're working with a word processor, that's not what's important. What's important is what you're writing. And it's the same thing with editing, whether you're working on film or working digitally just means that for me it meant I could go really fast so excuse me when I was working in film I could cut about 10 minutes uh, a week but on on computer I could go 15 20 25 I could you know my productivity jumped enormously because I didn't have to take the time to make splices so uh yeah, so, and, and it also had the advantage of making it very easy to compare line readings, where on film, it's really kind of tedious, especially with John Hughes. He would shoot a thousand foot takes. It's about, uh, about 10 minutes of film or more, 11 minutes of film. And he would shoot a close up and then the scene might be only three minutes long. So we'd get to the end of the three minutes and instead of saying cut, he'd say, okay, Let's do it again, you know? And so there might be three or four takes in a single take because he didn't touch the camera. And if it's a close up, there's no visual cues as to what the actor is saying. You have to listen to it. So on planes, trains, and automobiles, for instance, he would shoot a close up, he would do three takes. That's 3,000 feet of film, you know, which is a half hour of film. and there might be nine or 10 line readings in there somewhere that you have to search for and find and compare to make sure that you got the, the best one. So the computers helped enormously with that. Um, yeah, it took a lot of the labor out of it, but the mental, the mental process is the same.
Amazing. Um, you have collaborated with Lucas and De Palma. Um, are they different, like directors? In... Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, George never moved the camera. And De Palma is famous for moving it constantly. I mean, if you look at Star Wars, all the movement is in the visual effects shots. Uh, in the the rest of it, he he maybe panned. If somebody was crossing, he would pan with them. But that's about it. There, there's not a lot of complicated camera movement in Star Wars. Uh, George's gift, uh, his interest is more in uh, production design. I think his production design. If you look at all his films, he's come up with some extraordinary images. I mean, over over the entire. Uh, history of the of the Star Wars films, um, the imagery that, you know, the worlds that he conjured up, the, the desert world, the frozen world, the jungle world, the, you know, um, and the, 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 the Imperial Senate, and there was an underwater one. And I mean, there's extraordinary worlds that he imagined. Um, uh, Brian is more interested in, um, camera movement and uh, set pieces where, where he designs uh, scenes that, that are like a complicated puzzle that need to be, they're tremendously fun to put together. Uh, George's shooting style is much simpler. Um, and of course, you know, the, um, their interest in terms of subject matter is very different as well. <coughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, the, the the difference absolutely is quite quite big. But if I can jump to um, Star Wars for uh, a bit, <laughs> I wanted to ask you something. The um, Star Wars was has probably some of the most iconic and uh, peculiar use of uh, transitions in movie history. How did you come up with this kind of transitions? Was with a discussion with uh, Lucas, uh, was uh, an idea of your own, uh, was a bit of a collaborative effort? Yeah, well, you talk about the wipes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I always liked wipes. Um, when I first got into the business, I was cutting trailers and uh, wipes were traditionally used a lot in trailers and uh, to get a wipe made you would go to a company called an optical house and at the optical house they would have a sheet of paper on the wall and they would have uh, or they you know they give you a copy of it if you wanted and it would have all the wipes and it would show a little you know rectangle and it was it would show wipe this way, wipe that way, wipe this way, wipe that way, open up, come together, a diagonal one this way, a diagonal the one this way, going up the other way, going this way, and you know, iris out, iris in. So uh, there are all these choices you can make, a star, an explosion, a heart. They had all sorts of things, or you know, a Venetian blind kind of thing. And so uh, one of the directors I worked with called it the, the, this sheet showing all the wipes is the, the flags of all the nations. There were like a hundred different things you could choose. So I was sort of, I was sort of tickled by these things. And my first film that I did with Brian was called Hi Mom. And we used wipes in Hi Mom. And um, I liked, I wanted to emphasize, you know, I didn't want it to be quite, uh, as subliminal uh, as they normally are. So I had them offset the two elements of the wipe. So there would be a black line uh, visible on the screen where the wipe was. Anyway, so I think I had about five or six wipes in Hi Mom. And uh, that was my first film. Star Wars was my sixth film. I did five pictures with Brian before moving on to um, Star Wars. And in Phantom of the Paradise, which is our third film together, I used wipes again. And 
uh, in that case, uh, I made a wipe out of, there, there was a logo in the film of a dead sparrow lying on its back. It was the logo for death records in the film. And I made a wipe, um, I had to make a wipe out of that where it would, uh, we would zoom through it. And uh, so I always liked wipes and George had seen uh, Phantom and it was at a screening of Phantom that I first met George. So anyway, I came to work on Star Wars and we talked about transitions. Now, the inspiration for Star Wars was um, these you know, Saturday morning serials that they used to have in the 30s and 40s, uh, I think the Republic pictures or something. And they used wipes a lot, you know. So since that was the inspiration, it sort of made sense to use these devices that would sort of echo uh, what had been the inspiration in the first place. And he liked them, I liked them. And, you know, it's a great solution when you're going from um, a static image to a moving one or from yeah. a moving image to a static one or from one static image to another static image. It's a way to introduce motion into the transition. So, um, you know, it's motion pictures. You're always looking for something moving on the screen. It, you know, it's, it's the advantage of uh, a film over stills. You can have movement and any, so I'm always trying to introduce movement as much as possible. If I'm presented with a wide shot, I'm gonna use the parts of it where something's moving across the frame. I'm not going to cut to it just when everybody's standing still, you know. So you're always looking for movement, and uh, wipes were just an effective way. It accomplished a number of things, you know. So uh, that's how we arrived at it. It was, and it, with George's, uh, George insisted on them being soft edged. He wouldn't, uh, on High Mom, I had made them hard edged to make them stand out. And he didn't want that. He wanted the soft edge. So we did that. We threw the edges out of focus and, um, the rest is Star Wars history. Yeah, <laughs> Cine, I would say cinema history. It's it's something that I I study as well, movie editing and multimedia arts. And yeah, it's it's something really, really, really amazing to hear stuff like that from actually you. It's it's incredible. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and um, I have a question uh, always <laughs> on Star Wars. <laughs> what uh, we don't see in the theatrical cut? Cioè, um, there are a lot of ma material that uh, the, the public uh, don't see or, uh, or not. The little scene or uh, something. Um, yeah, we, we took some stuff out, you know, and... Uh... I write about that in the book as well. I mean, there was a scene at the beginning of the film that was problematic to cut because of the, the angles just didn't cut together very well. And then uh, as I was struggling over the scene, I'm, I was sort of thinking, why do we even need this scene? Because it's just, it's all exposition and information we're gonna find out eventually anyway. And then I thought, well, what if we took it out? You know, what would be the effect of that? And we took it out and, and the effect was a great improvement. And, uh, you know, the result was that we're introduced to Luke Skywalker organically. We find him by following, you know, we start with the battle in the sky, then we follow the robots down to the planet and we follow the robots to Luke. So as a way of uh, getting to him organically in the story, as opposed to arbitrarily in the middle of the battle in the sky, cut to the planet and there's Luke, you know, so, it just, uh, I thought it was an improvement all the way around. Uh, that was the big, the big cut. And then there were some later scenes of, of Vader walking through the hallways with the Death Star and um, he was saying stuff that didn't really matter, you know. Uh, but, you know, there wasn't a whole lot that we took out, but the, the stuff at the beginning was the major stuff. And then we moved, we changed the continuity of certain scenes I don't remember exactly how now, but uh, somebody wrote an article that was on the internet. They're very, uh, they were, I don't know how they did it, but they located the things that we took out and they sort of did a 
an explanation of all the changes that we made from the first cut to the final cut. Um, it's out there somewhere, I don't, I don't know where, but uh, if you're interested, you can find it on the internet. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, my question is, um, who are the director, modern, uh, young director that you would like to collaborate with? Well, uh, there are a lot of young directors I admire, but uh, I'm not really looking for work, to tell you the truth. I did 50 years, basta. Basta. Stop. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> un po' stanco stanco <laughs> you know there, there are directors I admire I, I think Edgar Wright is really uh, a terrific young director um, I can't think of off the top of my head there, there's, there, are many, there are many that I think are really uh, very good there's some that I think are total frauds uh, I can't understand why anyone likes their pictures, but you know, the gustibus non es disputandum. <laughs> Italian and Latin, it's it's really <laughs> big combo. <laughs> I didn't hear that. Fantastico. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if I can, uh, there there's a friend of ours that asked us if we could ask you a question on his behalf. So yeah, there's uh, uh, Robert Carlin that um, asked, uh, wanted to ask you, um, what were you thinking when you were making Star Wars? Uh, uh, were you imagining the, um, the impact that you would have had uh, not only in movie history, but also on your career, on your, uh, on your personal experience? <clears throat> Well, it was a tremendous uh, uh, break for me. I'd only worked with one director up to that point. And uh, George had directed American Graffiti, which is one of the most wonderful pictures ever made. I mean, I, I watched it again recently and it's just a, a wonderful picture. Uh, it's so charming and, and human. And um, it's just um, so, you know, and he had become legend uh, at that point, he was, he's, I think, exactly 18 months older than me. So it was sort of my generation. And here he was the successful Hollywood director, in, you know, out in California. I was living in New York at the time. So uh, the movie business seemed like, you know, some distant, far away, didn't seem like I could ever possibly be part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, to work for George was a tremendous opportunity for me uh, to work, you know, first of all, to work with someone else other than Brian, he, you know, listen, Brian was my, um, my mentor and he encouraged me and he empowered me and he, and, uh, he taught me a lot and, you know, if it hadn't been for him, nothing else would have followed. Um, but, you know, uh, George was, it was a great opportunity for me. And as far as thinking about the impact on the world, my wife was pregnant with our first child and I was more concerned with, you know, I wasn't thinking about the impact of Star Wars on the world. I was thinking of what am I gonna do? How do I get off work when she goes into labor, you know? Um, so uh, no, we weren't thinking about those things. I mean, I was, I, around Christmas time, I saw an ad for the picture and said, "Coming to your, to, you know, a, a, a theater in 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 your galaxy," and had a, the date May twenty fifth, and uh, it said in six track stereo, seventy millimeter and six track stereophonic sound, and I was dumbfounded because I, you know, I've been cutting sixteen millimeter until a couple of years before, and all of a sudden I'm working on something that's going to be released and. 70 millimeter it was just, yeah. just couldn't believe it so um, yeah it was very um the whole thing was very exciting and very demanding because we were working so uh so many hours every day six days a week and um balancing that with my home life and 
my wife and I had rented an apartment in Sausalito, which is about a half an hour's drive from where I was working. And uh, because the, you know, essentially Star Wars is a low budget movie. The original one was sort of a low budget movie for, for what it delivered. And uh, when I was hired, they said, we can only pay you for one car. We can't give you a separate car for your wife. <laughs> so, I, you know, so she would drive me to work in the morning and she would come back at the end of the day to pick me up to drive me home. And there are times when we weren't ready. I wasn't ready to leave. We had to keep working. So she was, uh, you know, seven, eight months pregnant at that point. So she would sit on the couch in the cutting room and she'd be knitting and <laughs> be cutting the movie. And I often thought, you know, there's all these people who wish they could have been a, you know, <coughs> excuse me, a fly on the wall of the cutting room and watch what was going on. And she was there and she couldn't have cared less. She was thinking about the baby and, you know, um, Anyway, it was yeah. <laughs> a very, very rich time for me. It was very, uh, you know, working on the picture and having my first child, it was all very uh, intense and, and rich. Experience, yeah. And uh, to talk about uh, another movie, very, very famous, uh, that I like very, very, very much, uh, Mission Impossible. Tell us something about the editing process of uh, that movie. Well, I was not originally hired to cut Mission Impossible. The original uh, hire was Jerry Greenberg. Jerry was another editor from New York who actually I had introduced to Brian. Um, Jerry had been the first editor from New York ever to win an Oscar for The French Connection and the famous uh, car and subway chase and you know he's, he's a terrific editor and when I wasn't available for uh, Dress to Kill because I was going off to do Empire Strikes Back uh, Brian said to me what am I going to do who's going to cut my movies because I'd cut his last five pictures so I said well Gary Greenberg's the best editor I know so which was kind of almost a mistake because I almost never got my job back uh, <laughs> Jerry cut Dress to Kill and uh, they hit it off and he cut a number of films for him so anyway when Brian was going to do Mission Impossible he offered the job to Jerry he hired Jerry and uh, um, I got a call saying that uh, Paramount wanted the picture by Christmas time and they figured they needed two editors and would I be willing to come on the picture as the second editor? So I said, yeah, I, fine. You know, I admired Jerry and, um, and I wanted to work with Brian again. And uh, so I signed on and the two of us went to London and Jerry was seeing a woman in New York at that time. And he would leave work on Friday afternoon and go to the airport and fly to New York from London. And he would come back Monday morning. He would take the red eye over and land in London in the morning and, and come to work. So uh, I, he did this for several weekends. And I'm, I, I think Brian may have heard about that. And I don't think he, I don't think he liked the idea, but anyway, at that point, they had done several pictures together and I don't really know what, what went on between them. Um, but they obviously had a history. And one day, Brian came into my editing room and we had divided up the, the film so that you know he would do some of the work, I would do some. And there were three major set pieces in the film. There's the embassy party at the beginning then there's the break into the CIA, and then there's the train chase at the end. So uh, the first thing that was shot was the embassy party. They were shooting in Prague. And uh, it was agreed that Jerry, because he'd been hired first, he would take on the first big set piece, which was this embassy, um, you know, the, the killing of the team. So, uh, I was doing some other smaller scenes that were cut, uh, that, were, that were shot in Prague. And uh, anyway, Brian came into my editing room one day and he said, 
I just fired Jerry. And I was rather shocked at this. And he said, I want you to come see what, you know, and, and Jerry was gone. I never, I, I don't think I even got a chance to speak to him before he was gone. So, um, he said, I want you to look at what he's been doing. And so I started watching. Now, this is, this is the first for both of us. This, this is the first picture that both of us had worked on uh, computers. We'd all been, we, we'd both been working on film up to that point. This is, you know, this is our first introduction to digital editing. And um, we were working on a system called Lightworks. And it's similar to Media Composer. There was a, you know, and as I saw it then, it was, there was an imaginary piece of film. There was a picture of an imaginary piece of film. And there was a picture of an imaginary soundtrack. And you could make imaginary splices in these imaginary pieces of film. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, like I say, editing is not technical, it's, it's mental. So um, I had somebody next to me who knew the system and I would say, I wanna do this, how do I do that? And he'd show me. And then he was sort of my co-pilot for about a week. And after a week, I, I knew how to work the system and it was, it was pretty easy to pick up. And uh, uh, we were talking about it with Jerry and I said, you know, this, this timeline thing is, you know, I described how I saw it as an imaginary piece of film. So he said, well, I don't look at the timeline. He says, I, I work on just the image. I only look at the image. So I thought, really? I thought it's kind of useful to look at the timeline. But anyway, so Brian said, I want you to see what Jerry's done. So I watched the, you know, I started to watch it and it was really great. And then all of a sudden it sort of cycled back and it was repeating itself and uh, with variations. And then, and then it repeated itself again with more variations and and I think what happened was Jerry got lost in sort of got lost in you know he wasn't looking at the timeline so he didn't realize he was repeating himself so I, I don't know how it happened anyway it was kind of there were parts of it that were brilliant and but overall the whole thing was was not working at all you know it was just so um, so I took it over so I had to I had to rework. I mean, I used a lot of what he had done because it was so good, uh, but I had to rework, you know, um, or I had to rework everything. And then at that point, um, Paramount had been in a struggle with Tom Cruise about the release date. Cruise always wanted it to come out in the spring. It was Paramount that had wanted it at Christmas and um, Cruise finally won the, the, the battle and it was announced that we were gonna open next spring. So there was no need for two editors anymore. So Jerry was gone, I was left and I took over the film. That's how that went. Hmm. Yeah. With um, talking with, uh, to Mission Impossible, with this movie, I think to Tom Cruise, you have a win um, the best pay vacation uh, in your life. I yeah. read in the book, yeah. Yeah. Rome, Venice, <laughs> Florence. <laughs> well, I had to pay for Venice. He sent me to Rome and then to Paris. And I said to them, I said, give me a week off in between Rome and Paris. So in the week off, we went to uh, um, Florence and Venice and uh, Lake Como. We spent a week on a wonderful vacation. <laughs> Have you ever been to uh, Venice on the, uh, uh, there is the uh, La Festa del Redentore. It's in- No, it's in, in July, it's their big holidays. The, it's their big, uh, they, they build a bridge, a temporary bridge to uh, the Judeca from the main, yeah. from St. Mark's. They put boats side by side and they lay a wooden platform across. You can walk. You can walk yeah. from, from St. Mark's to the Judeca across the lagoon. And then at midnight, they have a fireworks display that's fantastic. 
So I had yeah. seen it when I was a teenager and I thought to myself, I got to come back here someday with my, with my love, whoever it is, who I haven't met yet, you know? And that summer I got to do it with my wife. It was really ah. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> the, third, the third Saturday in July mm. in Venice. Yeah. I, I never see you, Benny. Nope. <laughs> like, Someday, maybe. <laughs> where are you? Oh, we are in Piemonte and um, Turin. You know? Yeah. Uh, we, I no, live yeah. in a small town. <laughs> well, it's not that you jump on a train, you can be there in a couple of hours. What? Yeah. <laughs> problem. Problem now is that with COVID, we're yeah. <laughs> we're stuck. Well, there will be life after COVID. It's not going to yeah. be. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> have you Have you been vaccinated? No. Not yet. Not no. yet. Here, the rollout is is not. It's it's going, but it's quite slow, and we're still young, too young to get it. So. Did you get a chance to get uh, vaccinated already? Yeah, I'm, I'm immune now. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I've been inoculated. I still don't feel totally comfortable going out. But yeah, yeah. Sure. <clears throat> so much is unknown about what's going on, you know. It's just, uh, it's a terrible thing. It's... Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Nobody thought we'd have to deal with a global pandemic. Nobody signed up for this, you know. Yeah. So, uh, but Venice is delightful. It's like Disneyland. You know. Disneyland with with taste. <laughs> Very delightful. I remember when the first time I went to Venice, you know, One, one of the wonderful things about Venice is you wake up in the morning and you don't hear any engines. You hear, yeah. <laughs> hear footsteps and you hear voices and that's all. Maybe some church bells and pigeons. You know. But you don't hear any engines. <clears throat> Unless I guess you're on the Grand Canal and they have the Vaporetto. But, uh, but I remember the, the, the sounds is very uh, different from any other city. And then all these little streets, you walk through these tiny little streets. And I finally, uh, where, from where I was staying initially, I found myself, I found my way up to St. Mark's Square. And you go from these very narrow little streets and over little bridges and around, and then it opens up into this yeah. fantastic piazza. I mean, it's one of the great moments in, you know, I remember the feeling. It was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. And see the bell tower and the cathedral. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful place. Mm. Yeah. It's a tourist trap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't, don't Coffee on, on in Piazza San Marco is quite uh, problematic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, but you should see it before it disappears under the water. You know? Yeah because it's not going to last forever. Yeah. Mm. Unfortunately, but uh, it's kind of I, I can, posso fare la domanda di Zach? Yes. I have a special question for you. From, super um, special. Super special. <laughs> from uh, Zach Snyder. I don't do I don't do sexual favors. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next, next question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. no. It's, a, it's, a, it's a simple question <laughs> from Zack Snyder. Zack Snyder. Yes. Was there a the, question? Yes. Yes. Wow. We are. We ask him if, if uh, he was. A, he have a question for you. Uh, he say yes, and the question my, is, is, uh, is easy. What is the best Brian De Palma story for you? The best Brian De Palma? Story. Story about him? Yeah. Um, yes, the, the, the movie, what's the, for you the best movie from uh, Brian De Palma? The best, the best Brian De Palma film, you mean? Yeah. Hmm? 
Sorry. Um, I don't know. It's hard. I think Carrie. Carrie holds up really well because it's a very simple story and uh, it's very, it's told very economically and the, uh, the characters are uh, beautifully drawn. Uh, I, you know, just off the top of my head, I would say Carrie. Carrie, that's such a beautiful movie there. Even the use of a split screen is something really, really. I, I was rereading the bit where you say that you you had to adjust the the eyes, the look that she gives uh, during the prom scene, and yeah. it's such a it's such an interesting and beautiful scene. It's it's really really amazing. Yeah. And the music is by you know Danaggio, who yeah. is from Venice. Yeah, and you translated for him as well. <laughs> yeah. Brian would say, uh, tell Pino, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. so I turn to Pino, I'd say, dun -dun, dun -dun, dun -dun. <laughs> <laughs> it works, so. They got a lot of uh, he, they, they made a number of pictures together. He's a very, very sweet guy, Pino. Conosciuto, no? Pino? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> but, oh, yes. <clears throat> but yeah, I, I think that if you guys don't have anything else to ask, I think that we could thank uh, Mr. Hurst for the, for the time and for the for the kindness, for the all, all the insight that he gave us for uh, his history, his, his work, and uh, yeah, it's, it, it, grazie mille. it was grazie, grazie a te. <laughs> and, uh, it was an amazing experience grazie. for real, and um, yeah, we'd we'd like to recommend you to check out his book. So you can we'll put the link in the description. But yeah, you you can get a long time ago in a cutting room far far away, in uh, on Amazon. And uh, I hope you I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you again, Mr. Hirsch, and we hope to see you again sometime uh, in the future. <laughs> That would be great. Piacere è stato mio. <ride> un italiano perfetto